Today on TechNATO, we'll be talking with Ori Raphael from Upsolver about data lakes. We're also going to be looking at some news from GitHub, some late text messages that went out from Valentine's Day, and find out about robots losing their jobs. That's all coming up on TechNATO, starting right now. Hello and welcome to TechNATO. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam. I'm joined, as always, by Don Pizet. Don, how you doing? I am doing swell. Excited for another great week of TechNATO. Well, that's a lot of pressure. I know. And it hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but it's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, one of these days we'll get it. And Justin, you think this is it? No. No, I don't think it is because uh, I wasn't ready. I haven't been mentally preparing for the astronomically mind-blowing episode of TechNATO yet. So, Yeah, I got to go back and watch last week's. I was, I was out of town and I... Actually, that I might have been it. it. I heard it was a train wreck. That was probably the best one. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Oh, well, that's not what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was down at Microsoft Ignite uh, where we were uh, hearing about all the cool stories uh, that you guys were talking about. You and Satya were hanging out. <laughs> we hung out a little bit. Um, yeah, I spent, spent some time, you know, azuring on the... Drinking kombucha. Sure. Uh -huh. Did you hear anything about GitHub Actions? I, I was uh, in our booth. Oh, I didn't okay. hear anything okay. about anything. Because I signed up for GitHub Actions like... Four months ago, uh, after because it's something Microsoft was adding, they're like, "Yeah, it's in beta. We'll contact you." The week after Ignite, boom, it's on all my repos now. And I was like, "I've been trying to use this for a while." I was just asking. For those of you out there, it's just a way to automate build processes on your repos. I did uh, get Don a. Uh, uh, oh <laughs> man! I, I did get Don a red hat though, a new red hat. Oh, oh yeah, cool! Compliment his old red hat. She see it. If you're watching, it's right here by my shoulder. The uh, oh, no, no, it's not there. <laughs> it, it might Maybe actually the, be the near my shot. shoulder. There it is. Yeah, it's right over your shoulder yep. on that shot. The uh, new red hat to compliment your old red hat. I think they're trying to make them more different than uh, other red hats that are out there in the world, and that's why it's white. Good point. You know, red hats. Yep. Or yep. they okay. just wanted to save some money making that one panel not dyed red. Is that's cheaper. true. That's true. Cheaper dye. Is it a foam trucker hat? Hey, I, uh, it is not. No. Uh, it's similar, though. Can did... you imagine if there was a trucker get out at a, at a truck station? It's <laughs> <laughs> just like, red hat. I... I'm also a sysadmin on the side. <laughs> I did notice how excited Don was a moment ago when uh, um, Justin said, uh, did you have it, too? Said, yeah, I'll give it to you. He said automation. Uh, Justin said automation. Uh, so we are playing Buzzword Bingo already. In full effect. And if you would like to join us, head on over to go.itpro.tv slash buzzword dash bingo. Uh, grab your card there. Justin and I are trying. We're doing the play online interface today rather than print it out. And it's it's working well. I've got, uh, got the middle degrees. square. And automation now. Yeah, well, it's saving real estate on the on the little what? desk here. Yeah, we care. Um, but uh, we're going <laughs> to fill up these cards. <laughs> like I said, last week was gold. <laughs> we're going to fill up these cards uh, as we are joined uh, in a bit by Ori Raphael, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder at Upsolver. We're going to talk about data lakes, which data lakes is not a, a buzzword, actually, but a lot of the things surrounding data lakes are buzzwords. So hopefully we'll fill those cards up in just a little bit when he gets going. But in the meantime, uh, we've got some news to talk about first. So uh, our first article is over on the New York Times, NewYorkTimes.com, Inside the Valentine's Day Text Message Mystery. Did you get one of the more than 168,149 strange texts sent in the middle of the night? And so uh, originally I was a little confused here because it's... It's November. Yep. And Valentine's Day is not in November. So, uh, but but I read on, but Don, can you explain a little bit about what's going on here? Oh, we're, yeah. No, I was just thinking, for some reason, that number hit me. There's like 360 million people in the United States. Yeah, like, it's not a huge deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but it can, there's it, like seven people that could have received this. It could have wrecked 168,000 lives. How so? Well, it's done. actually in the article. <laughs> you know, when I saw the headline, the first thing that popped in my head was, oh, is there a new Hardy Boys book out? <laughs> the Valentine's Day text Great message mystery. <laughs> Maybe Nancy Drew. I don't What's know. What's Nancy Drew been up to? <laughs> yeah. so, so then I thought, man, I got to check the date on this article because every now and then we get slipped articles that are extremely old. <laughs> and so, uh, but this is all very current. Uh, mysteriously, in the middle of the night. 168,149 text messages were suddenly released to people's phones. Text messages that, oddly enough, were sent back on February 14th, 2019. That means they were stuck in a mystery land for roughly six months. Now, in that time, they weren't delivered. This wasn't like a re-delivery. This was text messages that were sent back in February and didn't make it to the destination. And all of a sudden, 
popped out of nowhere into realization. Now, uh, the cause of it is actually not all that exciting, but uh, one of the third-party carriers that moves text messages between cell phone networks had uh, some kind of stuck queue that just nobody noticed, and it just sat there for, I think it's actually more like eight months. And they did a software update. So it shows you they update once every eight months. And when they did that, that's the scary part of this whole equation. Uh, so when they did the update, the broken queue started working and all of a sudden these messages were delivered. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of horror stories came out of this one, like where the guy uh, broke up with his girlfriend. Uh, she had never gotten the text message or vice versa. Oh, it was like she had sent him a text message he had never gotten. And then here it is eight months later and out of the blue, he gets a text message and says, oh, Maybe she wants to reconnect, but it turns out she still hates his guts. So didn't quite work out. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I was. I definitely thought you were going with rekindled love here. Uh, that well, it went with hate. Yeah. Well, a lot of people got an email to, or a text that just said Happy Valentine's Day. But Shannon Donnelly here in the uh, in one of the tweets that's uh, that's highlighted in the article said, "In technology ruins everything." News at three a.m. My ex's cell phone decided to resurface a text I'd sent him this past Valentine's Day when we were still together, which led to me waking up to a huh from him that from my perspective came out of nowhere so he's getting this text of love you babe or something and you know they, yeah they haven't been together in in months dun, dun, dun. so ruined lives just in that answer wait a minute question. doesn't this happen without this technology like well, whoopsie with daisy? alcohol oh oh this is different. that's what it was the cue was drunk <laughs> the cue was drunk yeah hey babe i miss uh, you ugh. it used to be easier to track the bug right back to the bottle you know but now you got to find it in the code it's a lot harder yeah uh, yeah <laughs> yeah. I like the one here. Uh Allison Chan or Candler, an attorney in Atlanta, I was getting ready for work when her husband Clark asked, Why'd you text me? Am I gonna get sued for sexual harassment at four forty five in the morning? <laughs> Which begs the question Wait a minute. What were they talking about on, yeah, on, Valentine's, on Valentine's Day? Day. <laughs> and how has that lawsuit not come to fruition yet? But uh yeah, so if you got any texts uh from the ex and you've been deciding how to respond, uh don't if it came at Yep. the middle of the night. Uh, it also highlights the fact that there are a number of companies that are involved in the transmission of text messages that oftentimes you've never even heard of that are you know not AT and T and Verizon or whatever, but are handling the interchange between the different networks. Yeah, they need some textual healing. Mm. Mm. That should be a uh, like a Weird Al song or something. Yeah, I'm gonna. Make it happen. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> uh, now I've got my project for next week. All right, uh, let's head over to our next article from CNBC.com. Uh, GitHub, now under Microsoft, finally releases an iOS app 11 years after launch. Uh, I wonder if this – did this come out at Ignite? Because I don't remember hearing it there, but uh, – Good for them. So what can I do in an iOS app uh, for GitHub? So I, I don't think my... it came out of Ignite because yesterday – uh, I was looking earlier in the morning for an app to manage like a pull request on my phone, and I have an iOS device, and there was nothing. There were a bunch of third-party ones that interfaced with the API, so I'm guessing it got released later yesterday. Yeah, maybe they were trying to get it out by then, and they submitted it, and you know how Apple just says, well, we'll just sit on this we'll, for we'll three figure weeks. It out. Yeah. Uh, well, well, good good for them. So were you, did, did you now get this app? Oh, no. I, it, the, it passed. I got on a browser and did what I needed to do. <laughs> it's dead to me. <laughs> yep, it's dead. <laughs> so what kind of things, though? Can it, You can do like a pull request. You can do... Uh, I don't know. I haven't downloaded it. You See, that was the thing, like, <laughs> with, I could have read the article. <laughs> with the original founders of GitHub, they said, why the heck would we want an app? It's not like people are going to be editing code from their app. And so, you know, it, there, was, there was an argument. People were saying, look, we could be responding to, to issues that are posted. We could be approving pull requests. So there were like non code development things that you could do. Uh, but the original developers at GitHub said, look, we have an amazing web interface that it's fully responsive. It'll load on your mobile devices. Just use the web portal, which is what Justin did. Well, that went on for 11 years. People kept requesting an app, but GitHub didn't, didn't make it. And now that Microsoft acquired them, Microsoft said, all right, time for an app. And so they've actually created one. But, you know, I kind of agree with the original founders on this one. Like, not every website needs an app. I know we've created this like social environment where people feel like if a company doesn't have an app, they're not a real company. But most companies have really good websites that do everything you need, and the app serves no real benefit. Well, half of, of apps are just basically a website wrapped into a, an app container. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm, and maybe that's what they've done here. Oh, I said a word. Um, but yeah, maybe that's what they've yeah. done here in this <laughs> Thanks, case. Peter. And oh, don't worry, we're, we've got an article about Docker in a little bit. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, I'll be all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but th thanks for thinking of me, Justin. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, I guess always. Uh, you know, they're they're 
uh, their Microsoft app has been out for a while, their Microsoft uh, phone app. Um, but just no one saw it. So you know how I found out about this before this article? Before I read, I did read through the article. It doesn't talk mm-hmm. a lot about what it does. Mm-hmm. Jackass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I found someone on Twitter was like, iOS only? What about us Android users? Ah, and I was dun, like, dun, really? Uh, oh, come can't on. Can't please anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're... Microsoft's trying to be helpful releasing these new features, and then people were like, well, I'm going to moan and whine about it. Well, that is surprising, though, because isn't Microsoft kind of making an investment in, in Android in the sense that, that their new devices, uh, some of their, their new yeah. mobile devices, are running Android? Microsoft is embracing both camps. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed a lot of companies do this where they'll schedule a release in the iOS app store first because you have no idea when Apple's going to actually approve it. Mm-hmm. Versus Android, where you know it's going to get improved, approved within 48 hours. And so they'll usually release one and then turn right around and the other one will pop up. So I suspect that's what will happen here. But, you know, Microsoft internally, they support Android quite a bit. But their their Office 365 platform, a lot of their other tools are both iOS and Android. Gotcha. All right. Well, this next article is right up Justin's alley. So let's take a look over at ZDNet.com. Programming languages. Python overtakes Java on GitHub as Google Dart use soars. Developers love Python, Microsoft's GitHub says, also revealing the site's biggest open source project. So uh, I know you've been a Python guy for for a while, but is that your number one language as well? Uh, It's pretty high up there. I guess it's uh, the right tool for the job. There's a lot packed into this title, by the way. I had to read it like four times. I'm like, all right, so Python's good. Java's going down. Google Dart's also coming up, and there's some really big open source projects coming here. I don't know why they want to highlight Google Dart. Yeah, apparently I, I've been living under a rock. I haven't heard of Google Dart. What is this? So Dart was originally meant to replace JavaScript and an alternative version of Chrome. Uh, it was supposed to be typed, a little strongly typed, and have certain features like a head of time compilation to be a little more performant. It didn't play out. They removed it. They went with JavaScript, so it can compile to uh, JavaScript. The big push for Dart right now, though, is uh, Flutter, which gives you the capability of building cross-platform applications using one code base, one programming language, with the wonderful tooling, and boom, it outputs. Uh, actually, we interviewed someone we from the Matt. Flutter team. Matt from Flutter, yeah. he sat right in, right in Don's chair. Yeah, over he sure there did. So I think that's probably what's driving Dart's increase. And then some Our of the interview? new. Uh, yes, probably. More than likely, I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, featured else? spot on uh, Technado typically leads to either acquisition or just r- amazing riches and sales. We did have that, that brief run where people were getting acquired or mm-hmm. funded. But I suspect that's why Dart is cropping up, uh, as well as some of their other um, updates for operating systems and, and platforms. I'm glad Python's overtaking Java because uh, I don't know who actually likes writing Java code. Was it just you? You have to because it's it's old systems that were written in it, and so it is. I mean, the, the JVM is a battle tested platform, so for large scale, I'll, I need to run all the time. It works, uh, but some of the new Java licensing from Oracle has kind of made things a little weird. So you now have to move over to a different development kit, and then it doesn't have the ease of prototyping, uh, developer experience, or kind of the more general purpose that Python does. So if you want to do data analysis, Python. You want to build a web app, Python. You want to automate some processes, Python. We're all good. And yes, I just just said automate again in case you missed it on the first try. You know, um, it was just a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago, where uh, Oracle was saying they were going to drop support for JDK, I was like 1.6 or something. And And the and the versioning there gets weird because it's like JDK 1.6 may correspond to like Java 8. Yeah. Or something weird like that. Well, there was another there was a, a third party that was stepping in and taking over support for that. Was it do you remember this whether it was the Apache Foundation or uh it might have even been Microsoft. It was somebody big that said we're going to take over support for this version. Was it was it Amazon? Amazon has their own one for their Amazon distribution of Linux because they had to take it over because the new licensing requirements for Java like, you have to pay for every time, yeah. like, a new computer has it on there. See, that whole thing has just gotten weird. Yeah, it's gotten, like, the other day, I tried to update Java, and it said, do you agree to the terms that you will send us money? And I was like, no. no. So it uninstalled everything, <laughs> and so I had to go fix stuff. You were like, good, that saved me some time. Yeah, I'm glad we, <laughs> we did it. Uh, and money. Yeah. There's some other parts of this article where they talk about other programming languages that have had a large uptick. Rust has a 532% increase. That's a fast-growing, but... Dart was 535. What did I say? 532. 
No, what I said dart, right? No, you said rust. You oh, said rust was I, I, I read the one right below it. Rust is right after that. The The thing with percentages, though, it might have been four people, and now there's eight people using it. So uh, just keep that in mind. That wouldn't be 235%. Uh, no, that, I'm talking about dark. <laughs> that wouldn't be 532%. If they had Kelly and Conway make the if list. four went to eight, <laughs> never mind. I'm not going to get into math discussion with you. <laughs> but uh, there was an interesting one on here, Apex. I'd never heard of it. Well, I had heard of it, but I thought it was something else. I went and looked it up, Salesforce. Uh, uh, yes, the proprietary, proprietary programming language for Salesforce. I was kind of surprised that PowerShell's on this list. Yeah, PowerShell, um, 140, 154%. Was, I hate it. Oh, good. Uptick. You screwed up the number two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I thought he was dyslexic for a second because the first one was 532, the second one was 235. But no. You're right. Mm-hmm. All right. Huh. Well, I'm glad that we're bad with numbers. Hey, um, <laughs> if you are uh, bad with Python and you want to get gooder at it, uh, <laughs> head on over to the IT Pro TV library where Justin and I actually did some courses together. I would know we did. Uh, uh, NumPy. Yep. And did, did we do the intro to Python together, or, or did you do that with somebody else? Uh, I think we did a version control one, and then we did one other one together. And that's some of those are if you just not only gooder but more gooder. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's different levels of good. Um, and so if you cannot get enough of Justin and I, and want to learn at the same time, uh, that's the place to do it. So, so in the immortal know. words of Depeche Mode, I just can't get enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're bringing all the song titles in uh, today. Uh, all right, next over on TechCrunch.com, uh, Marantis acquires Docker Enterprise. I didn't know they were for sale. I would have I would have made an offer, but uh, I am happy to see in this TechCrunch article uh, that they have stayed true to form and are using a container ship uh, as the as stock required. photo yep. as required. It's in the style guide as the, for the uh, companies. Another layup uh, by the TechCrunch uh, crew. In their uh, Getty Images search, but uh, Marantis, I don't know anything about them. What do, what else do they do, or is this a like a VC firm? No, Marantis has a uh, another product uh, shoot which I've forgotten now, but it's in here somewhere. It's not something I. It's, use. Like, it's like their on-prem Kubernetes offering or something like that. I forget yeah. what it's called. So uh, we reported a few weeks ago, or potentially last week. Do you remember, Justin? We we talked about how Docker's in trouble and how they needed to secure. Funding I think it was a few fast. weeks ago because Peter was here. For okay. that one. Yeah, where Docker's having like monetization issues. Right. So word was getting out that Docker was out of money, that their their scheme for generating revenue with Docker Enterprise was not successful, that Kubernetes effectively ate their lunch, and uh, they either needed to get a round of funding or they needed to sell. Well, it turns out sell is what has happened. So uh, Docker is now split in half, which is going to create some amazing confusion. There is the open source Docker project which is now back to being just a regular old open source company, and Docker Enterprise, which is a commercial entity selling commercial software that is now owned by Marantis. And Marantis is keeping that name of Docker Enterprise. So a lot of the tools that are a part of uh, Docker Enterprise are, let's see if I can find them here. Uh, It is the Docker Enterprise Engine, Docker Trusted Registry, Docker Unified Control Plane, and Docker CLI. All of those things are now owned and controlled by Marantis, the rest of it stayed with the open source company. What was crazy, the the one concerning part of that is the Docker CLI. How does that play into the open source project? Are they talking about just the features for Docker Enterprise are part of that CLI acquisition? Uh, it wasn't entirely clear, or maybe I missed it in the article. Um, it, I don't like. Why would they buy these? Like why? Like if it failed for for Docker as a company, why would you go? I like stuff that doesn't work. Can you give me more of it? What I imagine, and again, I'm not an authority on this, but with Marantis' specialty being in Kubernetes and Docker, you know, they had created Docker Swarm, which Mm -hmm. was supposed to be their competition. It failed. So by owning Docker Enterprise and already owning a substantial infrastructure in Kubernetes, I think they can marry those two together to create a more robust product. Uh, Somewhere, not in this article, but in another one, I had read about how it was supposed to make it a little more easy to be able to deploy Docker containers into Google Cloud mm. uh, through some integration that they had there. So they hopefully have a business model for this, but I don't know how much they paid. I, I don't know if that was in the article anywhere. It but says that they, for an undetermined amount. Yeah. So let's say it was a million dollars, right? So if it was a million bucks, at a minimum, they're getting publicity out of it. Like, hey, we own Docker Enterprise now. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see. Um, oh, it does say they raised $35 million in funding. So oh, that's oh, funny. That's separate. A, a separate thing, uh, which Docker, the company, raised additional money. Yep, not Docker Enterprise. Right. Yeah. 
How does that work? How do you get, we're in trouble financially? We're going to sell off this piece. Can you give us some more money? Is that how that works? Maybe, uh, you know, if you were Google and you, you didn't necessarily want to invest in Docker if they were creating competition for you, but now that they've split off the enterprise part, they're not competition anymore. And so now you're just giving back to an open source project. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But it just shows that their Docker enterprise model was not a successful one. And maybe Mirantis will do better with it. We shall see. Only time will tell. Yeah, hopefully we'll get the details of that sale um, as they come out. Uh, all right, moving now over to endgadget.com. Google's cybersecurity project Chronicle is in trouble. And part of it was because it was absorbed into Google. So, hey, maybe <laughs> all these, uh, you know, selling out to the to the big guys doesn't necessarily help. Yeah, so uh, about seven, six months ago, I think, we reported on Chronicle. So Google acquired this company. It was supposed to be a SIEM, uh, you know, a security, uh, what SIEM stand for? Security, I don't know, ingest, whatever. So it's, it's a, <laughs> a centralized logging platform to collect all your security events so that you can then interpret them. Okay. Security information and event management. There we go. So seems by and large, are pretty expensive. With Chronicle, they were going a different model on how they were doing the billing that was supposed to bring the pricing like way down on it, make it affordable and easy to deploy. And they have a really cool user portal. Google released several demonstrations of this and videos, got everybody excited, even created a form where you could put your name on the waiting list to start. I, I put my name on. And then here we are in November of 2019. I haven't heard... Uh, what is it, hide nor hair is the saying, yeah. uh, from Chronicle, and all of a sudden we find out why. Turns out they really didn't have any kind of good monetization plan in place. So the idea of it being super affordable, turns out they needed it to be more expensive to support the load that it was going to hit. So uh, they basically have not been doing so well. Uh, also, they had said that they were going to be independent, still able to operate the way that they used to, but... Google shuffled people around and all, and so they ended up not being independent at all. And now, basically, it's just kind of floating dead in the water. Now, that doesn't mean that it's dead. You know, Google could just turn around and say, you know what, let's invest some infrastructure or some resources into this. Google obviously has, or Alphabet has the money to do that, but uh, that has yet to be done. So if you, like me, have your name on that waiting list and are excited to try out Chronicle, at this point, even if you're accepted, it's not a good idea to use it because the future of it is not known. Well, if you read uh, part of this article, and this may just be you know, kind of the spin by the writer of the article, uh, it seems like this acquisition has also caused some internal turmoil for the existing employees. Like their pay was not adjusted because now they're Google employees. And now for similar roles within oh, yeah. Google shenanigans, they're like, we don't get paid as much. And then the CTO like got shuffled around, the CEO. So someone uh, from the Chronicle team said, we used to have a great culture, and now things have just kind of, nah. So, well, the uh, one that worried me was a statement that said, they have no product roadmap. Ooh. That, that's death for a, like a startup or somebody is growing. You're like, you have to know where your product is going. Because otherwise, what you're saying, if you have no product roadmap, you're saying, I'm happy with what we have right now. And what they have right now is not suitable for use. Uh, and this is, correct me if I'm wrong, but Microsoft re recently released a... And on the Azure platform, I seem yeah. that is decently affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it the, the market is just right for that, for somebody to step in. And Microsoft's been doing that with a lot of things, like Microsoft Teams, which has just been devouring Slack's market share over the last year. They, Thanks to you. Yeah, <laughs> people, <laughs> administrators and, and company owners like myself who look at it and say, hey, it's just as good as Slack. And Slack wasn't very good anyway, so there we go. <laughs> so... <laughs> in Don's defense, I've talked to some other developers, and they work at companies where they're like, "Yeah, we've moved from Slack to Teams." Um, so yeah, I go to Morton Steakhouse, then I look at McDonald's across the street, go, "Beef, beef, it's just the same." <laughs> you just go across there. Hey, at least I can find files when I need them. Okay, I'd be more concerned if the main complaint wasn't the fact that there were less animated gifs. The gift game is terrible <laughs> in Teams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very uh, upsetting. We we know where where our priorities lie within <laughs> our team. Peter's like gifts are dumb. Well, it's not just in, in his defense. It's not just Peter. I would say that there's a number of employees that have complained about the lack of <laughs> yeah. a massive Quality gift library. Gift. I tell you what, even if that's what I thought, I wouldn't tell you. It seems like that would draw the wrong type of attention to myself. I that feel like that I've the drawn biggest that let down my my day is I can't send a lot of gifts yeah. to or gifs depending on your your camp and that. Yeah. Through my business-oriented instant messaging platform. <laughs> uh, 
right, well, I don't I'm know not how telling you how to keep yep. your job, you Peter, but first. I'm just saying. I don't know how else you're you're supposed to know how I feel about something. Well, you're a ginger. Then you if, don't emojis. Then if you, if you can see <laughs> which Beverly Hills 90210 character I choose. Oh man, I thought you were going to go with Beverly Hillbillies, and I, you went way to the I left did too. I'm not sure why that. Also, is. Yeah, Jethro yeah. Bodine. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. No, I, I went with the spinoff. <laughs> you got that cement <laughs> pond. Know. All right, uh, let's head over now to CBRonline.com, which is Computer Business Review, of course. Google Cloud in major global outage. Numerous services fail. So. Tens of websites must have been affected by tens, this. Tens of websites. Yeah. <laughs> and Google blamed those websites. It was like, this is all your fault, right, Don? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I've actually seen this stock photo on more than one article yeah. these days. But uh, if we skip past that, what you'll find is that every cloud vendor has had outages, right? Not, not just one, but multiple outages. Amazon, they've had them. Microsoft's Azure, they've had them. And Google Cloud or Google Compute uh, is no... No exception. In fact, Google Cloud seems to have had quite a few outages just in the last year alone. So it's interesting to pay attention to these. There's a huge argument right now about how companies should be going multi-cloud, which is a huge pain in the butt. Not anymore, thanks However, to Azure. Uh, well, yeah, with Azure, but the with only, Azure Arc. <laughs> only if you have the the you need the, just the SQL stuff. All the other stuff you still got to manage. Look, I, yeah. I don't know what those things mean. <laughs> yeah. The big weakness on a lot of this stuff is DNS, because as long as DNS is working, you can potentially redirect people to another system. Uh, but in this case, they had an outage. The outage lasted um, quite a while. There were some services that were only effective for about two hours, uh, but then there were other ones that were longer, right? I believe the article mentions in here uh, 17 hours. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, that was a previous outage. Their multi-factor outage from earlier this year was 17 hours long. That's a long outage. To have this them like waiting that. for the, the text on their phone oh, to maybe? get the... Yeah, yeah, I was supposed to get my six-digit code on Valentine's yeah. Day. and uh... oh, oh, man. How horrible <laughs> yeah. is that? My PIN code is said, yeah. are you think I'm going to get sued for sexual harassment? <laughs> That's a weird thing to type in for multi-factor. Yeah. All right, I'll type it in. Yeah, I guess so. Yes. Yeah. Although it's a one-time password, right? So that means after that, you can't get sued. Oh, yeah. Does double jeopardy apply? <laughs> you are in the green. <laughs> saw that movie. Uh, so it did affect their U.S. East 1, U.S. East 4, and South America East 1 APIs. And the API interface is what's really the big deal because that's how they manage a ton of their different services. So it was a big outage. They did get it resolved. Uh, the final, from the first to the final announcement was roughly 10 hours, actually about nine hours and uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, which is a pretty big window for having an outage for like that, uh, for something like that. But it just goes to show that you can't rely on the cloud 100% for some of these things and that you still need to be vigilant and building in redundancies. In this case, Google Cloud had a number of other data centers that even if you were 100% Google, you could have spread your resources between those zones and survived this outage. So unless you are 100% deployed in U.S. East 1, East 4, and uh, South America East 1, then you would have been okay. Did they identify what the the issue that caused this is? You know, I have not been able to find anything. Uh, Amazon and Microsoft have been really good about saying, well, it was caching on this, or there was a BGP route there, or, or whatever. Well, I think the last Amazon one was a DDoS attack that caused yeah. some of their outages. Yeah, on, on whatever it was that powered their load balancers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, here they haven't announced. They just came out and they, they identified where the problem was, the APIs, right, and the, the uh, regions that were affected, but they haven't actually said what the cause was yet. So curious to see. Uh, buzzword bingo clarifying question for you. If Don said API, I can check off AI, right? No, no, <laughs> no, no, because no, that, that that's a slippery slope to going. Well, he said a word that had A and an I in it, right? He said, <laughs> okay. But I get to count the fact that you said that, right? Uh, I said clarifying question. That that's a pause. Oh, no, you, you I, can you can check it off. It's not going to matter if you saw my yeah. bingo card. You'd be like, yeah, nah. it's not going to. Well I did. Uh, I did say DNS though. That's uh, I, we got that. Okay, yeah, yeah, we uh, got it. We're not saying it back to you. <laughs> I could exactly. have named off speculation uh, and hit all these other things on my card. We did but. say that to you. you. You'd be pretty close. All right. Uh, well, maybe we'll help you out. All right. Uh, next over on CNN.com, uh, Facebook bug accesses iPhone's camera while users scroll through newsfeed. Um, that's... Uh, I, I, when we talked about this, I told you this is going to ruin my uh, Naked Tuesday Facebook scrolling uh, <laughs> from now on. <laughs> And, uh, I like how just it's on just Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, just Tuesday. Yeah, it's a, uh, I've got free time. It's like a ritual. Yeah, you're like, all right, here we go. Open a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Off come the pants, <laughs> and here comes the Facebook. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, well, yeah. you know, and that's how we lost listeners. We wouldn't report on a bug in an app because apps generally have a lot of mm-hmm. bugs, and that's how that is. But because it's Facebook, yeah, Facebook yeah. security first. Yeah, security and privacy first. When stuff like this happens, it certainly hits the national news, and this is another black eye for them. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what would lead to the. I mean, obviously, it's it's improper permissions that were set or, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, because it, but, Facebook does normally have access to your your camera to take photos to upload them to Facebook. So I'm assuming if you had denied that access earlier on maybe this bug wouldn't happen yeah i was wondering about that as well because i'm not sure if i've given my facebook app permission to use my camera like i'll yeah i know it's a, a bit of a pain but take the picture and then upload it through other I'm, anyway yeah, if you had the permission turned off like on, on android where you can do that really easily then it wouldn't have been able to do that uh on ios i think you just get one shot at it right to allow it or deny it and if you had already allowed it what happened here was as you started to swipe through the news feed your camera would activate and it would go hot. And they, to my knowledge, haven't disclosed whether or not it was actually feeding all the way back to yeah, where Facebook. Yeah, where that was going, was it being recorded? Yeah, because I think somewhere in the article it says that it does not appear to be. That'd be nice if rather than having to hit like, you, the person got to watch you read their story. Go, <laughs> dumb. The yeah, I guess I'll give them a like on this one, but <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's a fun one. Well, you know, it just goes to show that uh, if you don't trust Facebook for privacy, then you probably shouldn't have the app on your phone in the first place. Yeah. Hey, speaking of uh, of giving permission and things, I, when I've uh, updated to the newest iOS version, every app that I, when I open it for the first time is now asking me, hey, this app wants to use Bluetooth. Bluetooth, yeah. What, what's up with that? And if I say, like, no, music, you can't use Bluetooth, does that mean I can't listen to music? On so, that, or is it doing something else? Uh, it's something else. Okay. So uh, it, it comes down to beaconing. Have we talked about beacons on the podcast? I don't yeah. think we Is have. it just like a health check or whatever? No. So um, uh, a lot of department stores and stuff have started setting up these Bluetooth beacons. Oh, to say, and, oh, you're in the food court. Let me pitch an ad for And when you yeah. walk in, your phone is sensing the beacons around you. And the mm-hmm. vision originally was that you could walk into a store, grab a bunch of shirts, and just walk right out. And it would know it was you. It would bill your Apple Pay. It would know what you were carrying because they had tags also. Yeah. Uh, you know, NFC is not good enough because it has a real short range, but Bluetooth is long enough to facilitate stuff like this. Well, the problem is there were apps where you would tell them, hey, I don't want to give you location data. But then the app could just start watching Bluetooth, and the moment it saw one of those beacons, it would say, oh, you're at... Sorry, I'm trying to just, like, on the spot think of a store I, I name, and say Melvin's McDonald's. popped in my head. <laughs> oh, I have I no idea Whole why Foods. Melvin's I popped went. in my head. Uh, Burger King had a thing for a while where uh, if you downloaded their ordering app, uh, it would it would be notified when you got near McDonald's. Yeah. And it would say, hey, by the way, there's, there's a Burger King across the street, or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, so it turns out that Almost all iOS apps request Bluetooth permission, even though they don't need it. Yeah. And uh, some of them were actually using that to bypass the toggle that was said, like, if you said, I don't want to share my location data with this app, they were using it as a workaround. So Apple had to get aggressive with it and say, that's it. For now on, everybody's got to request permission. And the weirdest apps will request it. Yeah. And I, I mean, if, I feel like it's been every single app but when I since I've updated for the first time when I open that app, it, it, it asks yeah. me that. So Now, you mentioned like headphones. Headphones are actually connected to iOS itself, not okay. to the app. Yeah, because uh, I was like, oh, YouTube wants my, my Bluetooth information. Well, if i am got my headphones in and I'm watching a video, yeah, I guess I need to give them that, but yeah. it's a different... But if you have something like the Google Wi-Fi app where you need to use Bluetooth to connect to it to configure it the first time or the Amazon Alexa app, Mm -hmm. like they they would need to have that Bluetooth permission in order to function. Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. Sorry for the diversion there, but I well, think, no, I think we all learned something. It's, it's, it's an appropriate thing? one. And by the way, I, I hopped down to uh, my Facebook. You have to go to general settings, go down to the Facebook app, boom, and you can't change your permissions for camera and microphone. Were yeah. yours on? Uh, it appears so, but I do not remember giving it mm-hmm. now, permission for my camera. That little toggle could just be a placebo. Like, it oh, like could I'm be. this little dot. It could be. <laughs> it could be. Totally secure now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I don't have a naked scrolling Tuesday. Thursdays. Yeah. Yes, de- it's <laughs> definitely you. on Wednesdays. I need to relieve stress well, midweek. Somehow. First of all, I don't anymore either. Thank you, Mark. Uh, but Boz can. Yeah, get on it. Yeah, yeah. He's just watching. He just gets one angle now. <laughs> he's like this guy. So, uh, all right. This next uh, website is uh, is a strange site. Serial um, a lot of horrible. Uh, you know. Uh, the ads on this are ads weird. Ads on the sidebar, you know, from one of those uh, Outbrain or, or those kind of companies. But anyway, uh, SerialPressIT.com uh, has this story. Soldiers downloaded app Top Secret 
access all, well, I don't know what this headline's about. All your base are belong to <laughs> exactly. us. Exactly. Soldier this this uh, set us up. This headline bomb. was written by Google Translate. Uh, soldiers downloaded app top secret, access all their personal information. Uh, so basically, uh, it, it sounds like uh, soldiers were uh, forced to download a particular app to their phone. Uh, but these are also soldiers in many cases that have access to top secret information. And uh, it turned out that they were giving away a lot of data through this app. Yeah, so uh, when I first saw this, my initial response was to cross off the article that we wouldn't cover because it's it's almost laughable in its uh, grammar, I guess. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but it is a real story. Uh, the 504th Military Intelligence Brigade, which is a real thing, uh, they decided at Brigade HQ, apparently, that they were going to have an app developed that all of their soldiers could run. And that way, if there were announcements that affected the entire brigade or they needed to do a recall or whatever, they could shoot a message out via this app. They don't use text messaging and things for that because of, you know, the top secret nature and location awareness and all that other stuff. So it was all designed for this app. Well, unfortunately, the app, uh, we were just talking about crazy permissions. This app had the craziest permissions <laughs> yeah. that it basically had access to the soldiers' precise locations, contact listings, and had the ability to modify their calendar, which, again, you know, if you're setting some brigade muster— Yeah, hey, we've got training tomorrow at 0600. Then you could add that to somebody's calendar. At and 6 a.m., by the way. Good military clock there. Thank you. I know she didn't go for an afternoon time because that's a little harder. <laughs> 1300? Zero dark 30? O'clocks? <laughs> p.m. So, uh, so anyhow, uh, that's a big deal, right? <laughs> um, that we learned when was it that the it was like the Fitbit watches or whatever were giving away where the secret where the soldiers were. were. Yeah, <laughs> hey, all these soldiers just ran a five k outside of running uh, circles in this area in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, you can't be uh, can't be safe enough when it comes to these things. Uh, unfortunately, the article doesn't have a whole lot in here on what's being done about it, but one interesting comment was that Brigade HQ changed this from being a required app to being a recommended app. So uh, we'll, we'll see where that ends up. But uh, just another kind of word of warning out there not to trust the apps that you run. By the way, I went and looked at the author of this to see what other postings they had. <laughs> Every one of the titles is like that. Yeah, well, the author's name is not even a name. It's Popeye stabbing sub suspect. <laughs> Arrest warrant is issued for man. Well, that's that's about the chicken sandwich. I, I fully understand <laughs> yeah. that. Ostrich really soldier good. mauled dogs tasked with feeding. Wait, I'm sorry. The soldier mauled the dogs? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't make it up. Can you, I, I'm going to need you to check that and see if that is just, right. the headline was poor or... <laughs> Or if Egypt the... mummified birds, Egypt tamed wild ibis for sacrifice. Okay, these are all just Google <laughs> Translate. But by the way, while, while you are on SerialPressIT.com, uh, feel free to click on the stories on the right, such as 19 Freaky Women You Won't Believe Actually Exist, and uh, One Simple Trick to Remove Eye Bags and Lip Lines in Seconds. Yeah. All right, we might have to start establishing source standards. <laughs> <laughs> that one makes the cut. Uh, all right, uh, while uh, Justin is checking on the uh, dog, that was mauled. Yes, it was the soldier who mauled the dogs. Okay, well. Yeah, he was supposed to be feeding them, and apparently uh, was giving them an old knuckle sandwich. My apologies to cereal. Mauled for that. I don't know. IT. Yeah, because that's the, the dog's term. Yeah. yeah I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, let's go over to slash dot. Uh, this is our WTF dot article for Oh, the good. Uh, American... <laughs> <laughs> American robots lose jobs to Asian robots as Adidas shifts manufacturing. So they're taking our jobs. They're taking our robots jobs. <laughs> oh man! And they're also taking German robot jobs. Also, if you read the uh, article. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, we've really reached an all new level of society when uh, the robots that have taken our jobs are now having their jobs taken by even better robots, or maybe not better. I don't know. Cheaper robots. Cheaper robots. I saw a robot over at the off ramp. Uh, by the interstate, just just hitching a ride, yeah, just, panhandling. Hey. Was it Johnny Five? <laughs> it was Johnny Five. We'll He's work. Like, need input. We'll work for motor oil. Yeah, need <laughs> need batteries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, these are hard times, and just remember, everybody, that as we enter the holiday season, and that we give thanks for all the amazing blessings that we have, that we remember our robot friends mm -hmm. and uh, overlords, uh, and you know, uh, on Thanksgiving, open up your door to an unemployed robot in your neighborhood. Uh, and just let them know that we still care. And also know that they don't care because they don't have emotions. Well, or and, eat. Yeah. 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 And uh, they need your medicine for food. 
<laughs> well, wait, and they will come. <laughs> was that Old Glory insurance? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was one of the best Sam, SNL skits. Sam Waters, oh, Waterson. Yep. Yeah. Was... Yeah. For our viewers out there, if you're ever bored, go to YouTube and do a search for. Uh, it would be Old, Old Glory, Glory insurance. insurance. Robot yeah, insurance. Sam Waterson. And it's yeah. hilarious. Uh, it will protect you. <laughs> <laughs> they need our medicine for food. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, it looks like uh, we've made it through the news, so it's time uh, to head over to uh, talk with Ori Raphael, uh, who is with Upsolver. But let's take a quick break before we do that, right after this on Tagnado. Will you be in or near Gainesville, Florida anytime soon? Then you should come see IT Pro TV. Make plans to visit the studios, get a tour. Meet your favorite entertainer. See what goes on behind the scenes every day to bring the best of classroom learning to IT professionals around the world. Simply chat with the member services team on the IT Pro TV website and let us know when you'll be visiting. We'll see you soon. All right, welcome back to TechNator. We're joined by our guests now all the way out from California. We have Ori Raphael, who is the CEO and co-founder at Upsolver. How are you doing, Ori? Good. Thank you very much. Now I know I've I've seen the uh, Upsolver name around uh, at a few places, but for those that uh, that don't know, tell us a little bit about what you guys do. So Upsolver is a data lake ETL. It makes it easy to push data into the data lake, manage it while it's there, and deliver it to data stores for consumption. It reduces the time it takes to to run that process, but it also opens it for more users in the organization. A data analyst that knows SQL would not be able to do the process I just described, but it, they would be able to do it with Absolver. So uh, bridging the gap between the database and the data lake is kind of the mission for this company. So are you just involved then kind of at that step when someone is, is transferring uh, the data? Or are you uh, working with them uh, on, on longer term contracts? How, do, how does that engagement kind of look like? So it's a product, uh, actually, or actually a service. So we're not selling projects to customers. We are selling the product. We we do help them. So there is a every Absolver customer can open the chat and talk to a big data specialist and think about how to do their use case. So if you have a use case, you start you try Absolver, and, and if it works, you you just use the product. That's the interaction. So one of the challenges that uh, you know I, I always hear from other people is if we're moving data, so we're extracting data from one location, sending it off to another, uh, maybe both cloud to cloud or whatever, maintaining data security and privacy throughout that entire process is pretty challenging. And I, I've seen a few different ETL services out there where it required sending the data off to you know effectively someone else's servers to be transformed and then to be sent back to a destination. Uh, is that how yours works, or is this like a, a virtual appliance we deploy in our own environment? What is what does the, the deployment model look like? So you can deploy in your own environment, and that was one, you're right on the money there. That was one of the biggest challenges we needed to figure out when we started selling the service. And we couldn't really afford uh, to spend so much time uh, having security discussion and bringing all the compliance that was required to, for, for us to get the data, especially during the GDPR time. Uh, so we deploy into your private VPC and AppSolver employees manage AppSolver remotely, but don't get access to your data. So that's blocked on the cloud level. For example, on the AWS security level, level there is no way for AppSolver to get access to your whole data. And do you support all the all the major cloud platforms, or do you just focus on AWS? So today we we have AWS. We recently started to doing on premise as well, and we plan to do other clouds. But today it's it's very it's it's coupled very strongly with the AWS cloud, just because we are using all the native services, and we will do the same for the other clouds. All right, but in, is it is it able to be deployed on premises too, or is it really just designed to run in that cloud environment? No, it's it's working on premises as well today. It, it's kind of a different kind of it's a different kind of deployment. So with the cloud, you can take care of take advantage of all the elasticity that the clouds have. And uh, when we deploy on premise, it's kind of an uh, app server in a box compared to the cloud. Excellent. Well, I know one of the big challenges is that we have technology changing so fast that getting data from one location to another, sometimes it's the source that changes, sometimes it's the destination that changes. Uh, for you, how do you guys keep up with all the different potential inputs or the potential outputs that you might have to manage? Because as that middleman, that's a bigger challenge for you because uh, you know, two different products, we could always just find a, 
find a different middleman, but obviously you want to be the right one for each solution. You're right. And, and you, you, you can't win them all. So you can't have all the connectors. So it's a matter of where do you focus? We decided to focus on streaming and data lake inputs. So we can ingest data from any cloud. We can ingest data from Kafka or from AWS Kinesis. And our outputs are, most of them are AWS managed services like Athena, like Redshift, but we also support MySQL and Elasticsearch. So the use cases that we see that companies run on top of data lakes. Is this one of those things where if I want to take on the onus of like extending your platform, can I write my own connectors to some of these sources or is that all kind of all together in UpSolver? Uh, no, you can uh, and extend the system. Uh, one way is the transformation. So you can add your own functions to AppSolver, uh, for example, by using Python. Uh, that's one end. For the connectors part, you can just flush the data to S3. And AppSolver can read data like in any format that you're going to put it in S3. We'll be able to read it there. So S3 is used as a staging area for connectors that we don't have in the product. Now, before the interview, I, I was reading through on your website, learning a little bit about the product, and I noticed how you mentioned that uh, all the ETL operations can be performed using SQL. And I, yeah. I was curious about that, like why you chose that, because a lot of the other products that I've seen use their own proprietary language that you know you've got to kind of, kind of, uh, well, learn to use the product. And I, I was under the assumption they did that for performance, but what what kind of led you guys to go the SQL route? Uh so it, it was product market fit. So when we started, the, the dream uh, of AppStore was always to simplify the uh, creating of data of solutions on top of data lake. So I have analytics, I have machine learning. I want to use the data lake. AppStore should be a simple way to do it. And in the beginning, you just had a user interface uh, to do it. And at some point, we realized that no matter how good is the user interface, it's going to be friction for the SQL fluent users. So data analysts didn't like the first version of uh, AppSolver, no matter what we did with the visual interface. So we decided that there will be two modes to work with AppSolver. One is the visual interface that the first batch of users liked, and the other would be SQL, and the two would be compatible. So the idea is that you're going to write an SQL statement. That SQL statement is going to map the raw data, even if it's nested. So it's, uh, it will run on nested structures very well. And the output of that SQL would be a table in the data store that you want to get the data into. Eventually, AppSolver is an ETL system. Uh, so we went to SQL. So the data analyst of the world, the SQL fluent users of the world, will have something familiar to write their ETL, and they wouldn't need to learn an entirely new uh, user experience. I think that's pretty awesome. You know, a lot of these products are really intimidating and difficult to use. So being able to stick with a language that you already know is is pretty, pretty cool. And you know, you were talking a little bit about the early stages of the company as you kind of already started to iterate. Let, let's go back to the very beginning. Like, what what made you decide that this was a business that you wanted to get into? That you looked at the ETL landscape and said we could do something better than everybody else. I I I could tell I could tell you a lot about. Uh, um, how it was a, a result of careful planning, but like many things, it was by accident. We actually started by doing something a bit different. Our background is data. So I was head of data, in the data, integration, data integration platform. My partner was the CTO of a, group, a large group of data scientists. And we tried to solve a, a real-time machine learning problem. And we found ourselves uh, hiring five data engineers to, sat to satisfy the requirement from day one data scientist. So we wanted to build self-service. We started building our own infrastructure. And at some point, we were more passionate about the infra internal infrastructure that we built. So we decided to pivot and to build a cloud service over the infrastructure uh, that we built for, our for ourselves. So we built AppSolver for us and then decided to, to bring it to the world. They really took the AWS... Uh kind of platform didn't they right they built it for them and then made it available to everybody else um <laughs> I, I realize we've been using acronyms like crazy i i i'm, I'm good but i looked up etl <laughs> yeah yeah but just for all of our listeners out there we've been talking about etl what is etl and why do we care about it so etl is extract transform load it's an industry that's been around for quite quite, quite a bit of time and the idea is I have a database, I have raw data, and ETL is my way 
of extracting the data, making some transformation, that would be the T, and then loading the data into the data store. That's the purpose of, uh, of ETL. And when you're talking about uh, data lakes, these are typically going to be huge collections of information. And just to give people an idea of scale, like what's the, what's the largest data lake that you've supported so far? Yesterday, there was a webinar and it was hosted by Amazon that we presented uh, that, that, that case exactly. And that's four petabytes per month. Wow. That's a, that's, that's yeah. a lot per month. That's a rate. That's not a, a total. Doesn't that take a month to, to move that kind of data? Yeah. How, yeah. Does, how does that work? It's one point seven million events per second. Oh, is this like a click stream or or something like that? Yeah, it's a bunch. But it's a bunch of streams coming from Kafka. One point seven million events inbound and fifteen ta table outputs. That is a lot. That that's that's pretty impressive. See, that's where people have to remember. Like with AWS, they don't charge for ingest, but yeah. they charge when you go to get the data back. Yeah, out, so. <laughs> they'll get you every time with it. Yeah, I had a I had a. MP3 player that had that much space. <laughs> four, pet, four petabytes yeah. per month. $7 million. Uh, speaking of, so we've been talking about the, the types of data, and I, I was reading through your site, and the whole goal is you're changing this to a columnar format to, to help with performance, right, for some of this queryability. But from the ingest part, right, I'm, I'm bringing this in from the click stream, okay, that has a particular shape. Are there any data formats that you're just like, nope, we can't help you whatsoever or ones that are maybe just a little more difficult or you're like, nope, we're good to go. Bring it on. The, the latter. So ah. we, we don't, we, we don't say, uh, don't bring us this raw data. So any open format from JSON, CSV, Avro, Parquet, Columna, raw base, binary text, whatever you're going to send, uh, we can take. Uh, but when we are sending the data out to the data store, then we are, we, we are choosing carefully. So if you want to do analytical workloads, like ad hoc queries, then we are going to create a columnar data store uh, because that would perform the best for that use case. All right. Now, um, you know, as I was reading through about your product, one of the things I fixated on was that the ability that you were able to uh, perform this process using SQL, so a language people already knew. And in my mind, that kind of became the key feature of your product. But what would you describe as like the the key feature that sets you apart from any other ETL? So I would say that uh, there is a big difference between ETL and data lake ETL, and that's what sets sets Absolver apart. Uh, I think a very good example of that we have a, on AWS. There is a tool called AWS Athena. It's basically Apache Presto, or in other ways, in, in other words, not using uh, just the the acronyms. Uh, it's a way to query data directly from the storage, so directly from S3. Now, the reason the databases were invented, so the user would not have to, uh, to, to, to spend their time optimizing a file system. But now that we, have, we finished a, a full cycle and went back to a situation where you do have to build a file system which is optimized for performance, AppSolver is already doing that for you. So if you're going to open some of AWS uh, articles, they have these uh, 10 best practices of what you want to, want to do in order to optimize your file system for performance. Or you can use AppSolver, not think about it at all, and have the, the file system already managed for you. So ETL doesn't usually manage file system. It does insert, update, and delete into a database. AppSolver also takes care of that, and that's a big differentiator for us. I know that's sometimes a, a very problematic uh, decision, right? What how does this get stored depending on the type of data? Used to work with some scientific data, and that was something that we struggled with a great deal. Is Upsolver providing, are you making those decisions for me, or is this something that you work with the customer to, to go, all right, how do we map these together? Because that can get pretty deep. How does that all work? So Upsolver makes most of the decision. You can tweak some of them. For example, the table that you're going to create is going to be partitioned. You don't really get a choice there, but you can choose the partitioning strategy. Like you can do it by time, by custom fields, by day, by week. So that's the control that you would have. We, we, you can control the compression in many cases, but we are going to compress the data. If you're going to send the data to Athena, for example, we, we won't let you create a data store which isn't based on column uh, on, on a columnar format because that would be a bad practice. 
So we will implement the, be the best practice and you have some wiggle room between, like in, uh, within that best practice. All right, so I'm sure Justin is right now uh, compiling data that he thinks can maybe stump them and, and not make it in. Oh, but I, don't think I am, but I'm not going to do it on the podcast. And, yeah. and he's trying to put together four petabytes of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, you got to go. Up. Yeah, you got to. You got to. In the next twenty minutes. Raise the bar. <laughs> so uh, if Justin does want to reach out to you guys and and uh, and and use UpSolver, uh, what's the best way for him to do that, or anyone? So so it's a generally available service, so you can just sign up to, uh, on AppServer.com. If you're using AWS, you can uh, go to the marketplace, start using AppServer, and then it will be added to your AWS bill. Uh, there is a free trial, and because we are saying ease, ease of use, ease of use all the time, uh, we let you get to a production level use case full, uh, like on, your, on all of your scales, see that it actually works, and then decide if uh, you want to move forward commercially. That's the, that's the process. Fantastic, and thank you for having uh, a domain name that is just your name with all the vowels and .com as opposed to so many IT businesses. It's UpSolver with two Vs and uh, .io. Yep, uh, .io <laughs> slash CT4, I don't know. UpSolve.er. Yeah. <laughs> what would that be? Uh, Ethiopia? No, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for taking the time with us, and, uh, and hopefully we can uh, chat again with you soon in the future as uh, we have questions about data lakes and, and all that stuff. Okay, waiting for your data set for your five <laughs> petabytes. All right, Justin, get to work. Okay. All right. <laughs> and everybody at home, uh, thank you so much for joining us as well, but stay tuned because we have more Technado coming up right after this. I'm James Packer. I'm the general manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training and last year alone they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. All right, welcome back to Technado and thank you to Ori for joining us all the way from California and uh, I'm glad you guys understood uh, what he was talking about. <laughs> were you in the dark the whole interview? <laughs> I thought we were talking about lakes. You were waiting for the fishing part? Yeah. Like, like, this is a security company, right? Fishing? Oh, where is your lake house? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fishing. Was that on? Oh, did I just blow a... Uh... No. No. Good. no. Dang it. <laughs> we, oddly, I feel like that should be a buzzword. Yeah. It's too easy. It's like putting the on there. You know, <laughs> this is true. In, in this show. Though I don't think we talked about that this week. But, no. Uh, but hey, before we let you folks go, I want to let you know about a couple things coming up from ITPro TV. First of all, uh, we've got all of our webinars over at itpro.tv slash webinars. You can head over there and see the past ones uh, as well as the ones that are coming up. And our next one is one that we've been getting a lot of requests for. Are you ready for DOS? Microsoft uh, or Windows Virtual Desktop is ready for you. And I'll tell you what's confusing about this one, Don, is that uh, uh, DOS sounds a lot like DOS. I would have said DAS. I would have said DAS. Would you, though? Yeah. Is it, you, say SAS? you say SAS. 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 DAS. So are you ready for DAS? Yes, yeah. Okay, I guess I'll take that. Desktop as a service. Okay. It's still too close. Uh, that is Thursday, <laughs> November 21st uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, U.S. Uh, so love to have you there. Mike Roderick's going to be uh, showing you all about that. And I know they were they were talking a lot about DAS. That, I just sound country when I say it like that. DAS? Yeah. They were talking a lot about DAS over at uh, Microsoft tonight. <laughs> I was talking to this one company who was explaining they That's have a... That's a meme, if I ever did. <laughs> they, were, they were talking about um, how they help... Uh, they have a solution so you can access local printers because that's difficult in, in they can get printers to work that's what they said but if you're using ah. desktop as a service and you want to connect to the network printer that that was hard and they have a whole certain solution yeah. for that it's like, i can barely connect our printer in office that's been built into like rdp for 25 years <laughs> yeah that was the name of the company rdp no it's kidding uh, <laughs> i was talking to microsoft yeah. apparently um but yeah so anyway we'll we'll learn about what the real problems are with das um on 
Thursday, November 21st. Uh, uh, for now on, we are going to have a NAS article every single week. Yeah. Yeah. slash webinars for that one. And uh, and while you're on the internet, uh, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado. Uh, we've got a 30% off coupon code for you to check out IT Pro TV, uh, as well as a form you can fill out to get a demo of our Teams features for businesses. Uh, that's over at go.itpro.tv slash technado. Uh, anybody get bingo there? No. Does that website still work if you're on a DAS? <laughs> it, it should. Okay, I was just making sure. Uh, because well, if you're using Edge, you can use that on Linux. If one of you had my card, you would have won. But because it's my card, what did what did yeah. you say that we did not? DNS uh, and pretty encrypt. much everything. DNS and encrypt. Oh, we're giving you the diagonal yeah. there with computer yeah. and robotic. Uh, yeah. Shoot. Yeah, I didn't uh, get well. bingo either. I needed malware and breach. I was an AI and cryptocurrency away. Uh, if I had gotten that API thing, it's still Yeah, we didn't have any uh, cryptocurrency articles this no, week. Well, so. There were not a lot of security related stuff. We had a lot of development focused stuff with uh, um, Python. The ebbs and flows GitHub of technology. And, yeah, it's weird. It's like different stuff each week. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah. We should make a like podcast news. and keep up with it. Yeah. Hey, uh, if you want to see what's next week, uh, join us back here then, but that's going to do it for today. <laughs> We'll see you next time right here on Technado.